All right, welcome back. Here we go again with a book called Get Free Houses, written by Austin Rutherford. Uh, he's he's very active right now on social media, is promoting some of his courses and things. And and this guy, you know, he appears to be somebody to listen to. He's only, I think he's something around like 30 years old and he owns a, a real estate portfolio worth $15 million and uh, has massive passive income with properties being managed by other people and uh, continues to build more wealth. So pretty interesting guy, young dude that uh, built built his own network and, and created things from scratch. Uh, so Get Free House is really, this is uh, a guide to use the Burr method in real estate, which we'll get into, to essentially purchase houses that are somewhat undervalued for one reason or another, usually because they're, you know, run down, they need a remodel, something like that. The seller's in a certain situation. So you can get these houses for cheaper than they should be valued for. And then of course you can do the remodel, the renovation, et cetera, and get that value up and then refinance these uh, for more than you actually paid for the house. And therefore you're all in using none of your own money and you have, you know, 20 to 30% equity in the home. So it's a pretty cool method. Obviously it takes a lot of hard work, which you should not expect anything different in real estate or any other game where you can make a lot of money without using any of your own money. Right? So get free houses, the simple guide to creating a life changing wealth without using any of your own money by Austin Rutherford. Let's jump into it. So the first thing I want to mention is he says, there are reasons why people invest in real estate. And he gives us a few reasons here uh, that will determine, you know, why we go through the rest of this book. So number one is cash flow. When you own a rental property, you are the owner of the cash flow, right? Both the amount that comes in and is owed to a mortgage payment, as well as any profit on top of that, that's just coming into your bank account. Now, people who own the cash flow rule the world, right? Uh, and so that's one reason you want to be in there. Tax breaks and deductions. So when real estate is used as a business, uh, you can actually depreciate the property. And when you have depreciations, you get tax breaks, right? So um, similar to any business, you, you have certain tax advantages. Number three is the appreciation of the asset. So while you can depreciate the asset on paper, it also is appreciating in the real world, right? So rent goes up over time. The amount of mortgage that you owe is going down over time. The total value of the home is probably going up over time, right? So you get appreciation. At the same time, you get de depreciation, which is a crazy concept in real estate. Number four, a perfect way to build equity. So I kind of lumped that into three, but as you continue to pay down your mortgage, you owe less, you own more, right? Number five, diversification of portfolio. As an investor, there's nothing more important than diversifying your portfolio and real estate sector happens to be where a lot of investors, entrepreneurs, and business owners alike place their income to build generational wealth. Number six, leverage. To own a $100,000 house, you do not have to pay $100,000 cash. You normally have to put down 25%, right? So you only have to pay 25 grand to own a $100,000 house. But he's going into how to buy the house and get 25% equity without even using any of your own money. So that's where this book gets interesting. Okay, we're going to skip straight to chapter two, which is titled Chasing Money Versus Residual Income. Now, Austin started his career in real estate at the age of like 21. He paid a mentor to help him get in the game, learn how to buy houses right, flip houses, etc. So he started flipping houses. Uh, at the age of 21, he did his first deal. He made $107,000 on that deal. And so then, of course, he just kept rolling, right? He starts buying and flipping houses over and over and over. Now, if you're making any, you know, I mean, if you're making 40 grand up to a hundred grand on a single house, of course, you're going to keep doing it. It's a great, great income. If you can do a handful of those per year, you're making a lot of money, which he was. 
but he had a friend who started in the game about the same time as him. And they went to, you know, they went to lunch and they're talking about their, their real estate. Well, his friend was purchasing and keeping properties as rental properties. And this is where it clicked for him at one point. He says, uh, the first few years of our business, I tended to have more cash flow and more money because I was chasing money today, flipping and wholesaling houses. He, on the other hand, wasn't cash heavy as he was playing the long game, buying rental properties and building wealth for his future. Around five to six years later, I was talking to him and we were just catching up like we do usually do. During the conversation, I told him how I ended up flipping a couple hundred houses. He, on the other hand, instead of flipping and wholesaling a couple hundred houses, kept almost every single one of those houses as rentals. While I had a lot of money, he was building wealth for the long term. He told me he did a refinance of a few of his properties, paid off half of them from the equity he created, refinanced the other half, and walked away with a $1 million plus check, 100% tax-free. And he goes, hang on a minute, what? Right? So when you pull, when you refinance a house and pull out money, that's not a taxable event. Taxable events happen when you sell a house, right? When you, in a, in a way, execute your profit, right? It's similar to the stock market. If I buy and hold a stock forever, there's no taxable event. So I, in, in essence, I have unrealized gains. So I could be up thousands or hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars in a stock and I have unrealized gains. So until I sell that stock, there's no taxable event. But the day I do sell it, now I owe the government a portion of my profit. Same thing in real estate, right? So I hold a house, the equity is growing and I don't owe the government any taxes until I sell that property. When I sell the property, now I owe the government their taxable share, right? However, to refinance a house through a bank and pull that equity out is not a taxable event. You didn't you didn't change ownership at all. All you did is transfer your wealth from in the house to a mortgage and now it's in my bank account. So you can pull that money out. So that's where a, tax, a non-taxable sort of execution of the funds uh, can be be done in a, in real estate. So he refinanced half his house. He's, he paid off a bunch of his houses. He had enough remaining in that refinance to just keep a million dollar check in his bank account, 100% tax free. So this is a this is where the game of real estate gets wild, right? So he said, this was my big aha moment. This is where I realized I had been chasing money for the last five or six years of my life and wasn't building real wealth. Wealth is through ownership. Wealth is through playing the long game. And I could not agree with that more. You know, the more I do business in stocks and real estate, the more I realize you want to own assets. You want to be the owner of assets and sort of own that cash flow and allow the market to work in your advantage, right? One advantage of being in real estate is it puts you on the good side of the way things are, as Jim Rohn says, right? And the government, for example, uses the printing of money to help them pay off their debts, which causes inflation. So let's say the government runs up a trillion dollar debt in bond, you know, through the selling of bonds or whatever. And one way to pay off those bonds is not by increasing how much they gain in taxes, but by printing some money. Now they have a bunch of money on hand. They can afford to pay those bonds off, et cetera, right? It's easy because they just magically made money out of thin air, paid off their debts. Well, how do you get on the good side of inflation then? You own assets, because assets will go up in their price to accommodate for the inflation, right? And then your rent will go up as well as a result of, you know, the dollar paying for less. You have to charge more dollars. So you now your uh, total value goes up in dollars. Your rent goes up in dollars, but your mortgage stays the same in dollars. So now you're on the good side of inflation, right?
depreciation. He goes into how you can depreciate a house, right? So he says, let's up that a little and say you bought yourself a single family house worth $1 million. It can depreciate over 27 and a half years. And that means that you will get $36,000 of write-offs every single year. That's every year for the next 27 and a half years. In the end, you end up saving a ton of money in taxes you would have had to pay to the government. P.S. When you depreciate your house, the property will continue to go up in value with inflation. The depreciation is you losing money on paper. I know this sounds complicated. I don't ever do these depreciation schedules for myself. Contact your accountant or CPA. So you're depreciating the house on paper, but it's appreciating in the real world. That's one of the mind-blowing things of real estate. Just like any business, you know, let's say you own some company that has a large office or, you know, my parents are in the farming industry. So your equipment is, you know, becoming devalued. You have vehicles, you have farm equipment, you have office space, you have computers, all these things are becoming worth less every year, right? They have more use, more wear and tear, more miles. They just compared to the new stuff, they're worth a little less, right? And that's, that's part of doing business. You have depreciating assets. So in real estate, your asset is the property itself. So in, in one way, it is depreciating, right? Carpet gets old, walls need repainting, appliances need fixing, et cetera. A, ver a variety of things could truly be depreciating, but not at the rate that they allow you to claim in reality, right? But at the same time, the property is appreciating as i just explained with the whole inflation thing and the way that real estate works it his, historically it it grows you know at two to five percent a year way faster in the last few years but that's because the government's printing money like crazy okay so let's jump to the burr method what exactly is this method that austin is using to get free houses so the burr method is b r r r r right so buy renovate rent refinance repeat buy renovate rent refinance repeat so he gets into how you should start uh assessing properties and uh learn how to evaluate a property before you buy it right and and really this is a numbers game you've got to be able to do your numbers you need to know what you're looking at what you can purchase this at still make the renovations and what that um likely value will be and then once you have that ability to sort of evaluate the property as is versus what you can turn it into and what it will truly sell or rent for then you can go ahead and make the purchase right so you've got to get good at your numbers here and and uh obviously if you're new to the game get a little help in evaluating a property he goes into his first burr deal i already mentioned it a little bit but he was 21 years old. He bought this house for, for like less than 50 grand, something, something very cheap. He had like 150,000 of renovation costs. And then he ended up selling the house for well over $240,000 or something. And, and he made $107,000 uh, off of that one deal. So that's, that was his first experience, but he, he paid a mentor tens of thousands of dollars to help him get, get him started. So, you know, it's interesting how, how many of us want to go it alone and then hope to be successful. And yet, you know, Austin, very wise at a young age, paid somebody to help him figure the game out. <laughs> I like this quote he ends this chapter with. He says, you can have everything in life that you want. Just buy the asset first. A quick blurb under chapter five which is titled buy, he says, you can never fix a bad buy. Okay. So going back to what I just said about the numbers, you need to, uh, you need to do your due diligence, make sure that the purchase price, the renovation price, your unexpected expenses, whatever you're going to have to pay multiple fees, all you gotta, you gotta make sure you've got it all nailed down so that when it all comes down to refinancing you're not short a whole bunch of money and now you've got to use a bunch of your own money to try and even make this cash flow positive or something right so if you end up too far in the negative you can never fix that 
you know, I mean, as I'm reading this book the whole time, I'm going like, you know, he, he's talking about using none of your own money, but I keep thinking like, you know what, you could probably throw five, ten, fifteen thousand $15,000 of your own money to get that property to a positive cash flow place. And you're probably okay. But of course, using none of your own money and still having positive cash flow is far better, right? And that's what he's talking about. And that's what he does. But if you have to use too much of your own money, you, you either go broke or you never catch up. You you have a rental property that's negative cash flow and you might not be able to sell it for positive either. He gives you some very good detail on where he gets lists of potential sellers. So you're looking for people who have certain qualities, right? Like they own more than 50% of the equity of their home or it's a second house where they don't actually live there or the house is in you know, default or had the water turned off, et cetera. He gives you those lists where you can find these things, how you can understand uh, potential sellers that would sell a house for, you know, a good value to you. He, he gets into the renovation piece and managing contractors and things like that, right? You may not be a contractor or have any knowledge about how much these things cost, how much time they take, et cetera. Now I'm a big DIY guy. I enjoy, you know, doing remodel projects and stuff like that. When we bought this house that I'm in, we moved a wall, we expanded the pantry, we redid all the lighting, we painted everything, we redid the floors, and I did 90% of that by myself. Uh, I didn't put the carpet in, but everything else I think I did myself. <laughs> and um, let me just tell you, everything you're going to do takes way longer than you thought, costs way more than you thought, and uh, has more surprises than you, you could anticipate, which is why when you buy, you know, pay somebody with experience, they kind of know what they're getting into. They're going to be much more efficient. They'll waste less in, you know, in time and materials and runs to Home Depot, et cetera. So when, you know, when you go to re renovation, you can do it yourself, but just, you know, if you want to move quick and you want to get renters in that property and stuff, then uh, it's worth paying somebody. I have a house that's been vacant in Southern Utah for 10 months now because I've been renovating it myself. And I, you know, I've, I've kids engaged in sports. We do, you know, I've, my job causes me to travel all kinds of things. So I, I never get down there. It's like I've I've hardly spent any time down there. And so that house just sits there vacant. Now, part of that's intentional because we like to use it ourselves, but um, it certainly could have been a massive revenue source for me over the last year. Had I just paid someone to, to get that thing done and, you know, say 60 days later, I got tenants in there. It would have been cash flowing me a bunch of money, right? So things to think about. Uh, how do you manage a contractor? And he he actually gives you resources here, questions to ask, lists to give, checklists in a property. When you go do your walkthrough, what things you can do to sort of estimate the cost, how to manage contractors. He said he learned the hard way. The cheapest contractor usually means more headaches. So he pays the, you know, the middle grade or higher end uh, contractors to do to do a good job and give him a less headache. I found this part pretty interesting. He says, we use the same products and the same finishes. Instead of using different floors on every property and wasting 500 worth of flooring that goes into the trash every time a project is done, we always ensure that we use the same flooring in all our projects so we can move material from one job to the next and have no waste. But beyond that, if you do get a call from a tenant saying that a hole got punched in the wall or perhaps the floor is messed up, you would find it extremely easy to have that fixed right away. Otherwise, you'd be asking about the flooring type or the color of the paint on the wall, possibly having to visit the property, then going to the store and back to the property. So he uses the same materials on all his remodels so that when his tenants have a problem, he can easily fix it. He can also roll those materials, whatever's left over, into the next project, eliminating waste, and, and it simplifies everything for him and his crew. Also, when you're trying to analyze cost, you've got those numbers down. You don't have to go rework it all. You can sort of just go, well, has, has this material changed in price at all? If no, boom, 
we're good to go. He goes into how to find renters and, and things like that. Um, Zillow is one of his best sources, he says. However, he, in the end of the book, says that he basically chooses to pay um, property management companies to manage his properties because managing your own properties is not freedom, and that's his goal. He wants freedom. He wants financial freedom, time freedom. He wants the ability to choose what he's going to do with his time on a daily basis. And so using pro you know, property management companies takes the headache off of your shoulders, puts it on them. He goes, I'll manage making sure that the check shows up in my bank account every month. <laughs> Before I move on too far from the renovation process or the materials used, he, he uses high quality materials, number one, to attract better tenants, which cause less headaches too. They do less damage to your property. They're more reliable. But also, because when you harden your property with like, you know, um, very high quality countertops and tile and stuff like that, you know, those things break less. So over time, you have fewer repairs and things like that. So a little bit extra money in the beginning um, causes less headaches down the road. And of course, uh, if you can charge more and you get higher quality tenants, then everything's going to work better for you anyway. Uh, I'm not going to go into this, but he goes into checklists and questions on what to ask your tenants before they move in, how to find a good tenant, etc. cetera. Um, which is very important to, you know, being successful in the real estate game. If you get people that are not going to pay you money, you're going to miss out on several months just to try and get them evicted. And then some of those people that are just scrubs, they'll destroy your property out of spite because you're kicking them out of a property that they didn't pay to stay in. Right. And so, you, you know, you can lose big uh, in those moments. He does say it happens, but it's very rare. He's been in the game for many years with, with hundreds of properties, and he's had one tenant that just paid the deposit, never paid rent, burned holes in the floor, broke stuff, all this stuff before he left. That tenant cost him like four to six months of rental plus like 10K in damages. So it can happen. Right. And that's why expanding your portfolio beyond like one or two properties can sort of mitigate that risk. Because like if you're losing out on rent on one property, but you own 10, well, the other the other nine can sort of cover you on that. Right. But if you only have one property and your tenant does something crazy like this, now it's all on you. Right. And your job or whatever to pay this. So the larger your portfolio of properties gets the more it kind of can cover one another as you have vacancies and damages. The last you know, few chapters of the book talk about the finance portions, how to refinance. And one thing I've not really mentioned here is he uses other people's money. So he uses private lenders to do these deals. So he'll go and do a, he'll go find a private lender who can lend him say two, $300,000. He'll go buy a house for 100 grand, 150 grand. He'll do the renovations, et cetera, using that money. Then, since he bought right, did the reno, got the renter in there, has the rent increased, et cetera, and now he has a new value on the house, he can go to the bank and refinance the property. The bank will give him 75% of the property value. So then he can pay his private money lender back. 100% of their money plus interest. The bank has refinanced, has financed the house. Uh, he has 25% equity without using any of his own money. So he talks about how do you, how do you get a private money lender? How do you, you know, find those people? What would you say to them? Those kinds of things. And then of course the process of, of getting the, the house refinanced and all those things. One thing he says is you can have you can only have 10 conventional mortgages in your name at one time. So once you've got 10 uh, properties in a conventional loan attached to your name, you have to move on to other, uh, other options. I want you to read the book. So I'm not going to tell you all how, how to get the private money lenders and, and all the details there. I want you to go get this and read it for yourself. And of course, sign up for his courses. One thing he provides to all of his lenders is a private money lender credibility packet. 
that gives him credibility, answers a bunch of their questions, etc. Two two more things that you should know. Chapter 12, flipping or keeping as a rental, how to determine. He's got three options, right? Keep it as a rental, flip the house, or wholesale the house. And he walks through his process here on how he decides that, right? He says, I follow this simple formula. If rental income and fixed expenses equals a minimum of $400 per month positive net cash flow per unit, I keep it as a rental. And then he goes on how to determine that. And, and he says he's buying houses between $100,000 and $200,000 worth of value. So if the higher your house goes in price, the more money you need to keep monthly because it's a ratio, right? So if you're buying like a million dollar house, you got to have, you know, a thousand or more or whatever, whatever the ratio is in positive net cash flow. So, uh, so that your kind of debt to income ratio stays positive. Second is we need to be all in for less than what the bank refinances us at, right? So as I mentioned, he wants to refinance this, be completely covered by the bank's financing to pay his private money lender and have none of his own money into the house. If it does not fit that description, then we look at this as a flip. So then he'll flip the property. He goes into his qualifications there. If it doesn't fit, then he'll wholesale the property. And if it doesn't fit, if the numbers don't work, then, then he moves on to the next deal. He passes on this deal. So it's a number numbers game. You know, you got to call and work really hard to find these, these unique deals. And then when you do, you can capitalize on it. He gives you lots of resources through this book. And one of the places that he uh, sends you is to his website, www.howtogetfreehouses.com. You can, you can sign up for his courses. You can download some of his questions, his uh, packets, different things like that. So, um, Again, financial freedom is having total freedom, right? Being able to decide what you're going to do with your money and your time and your day. And so uh, that's what he is after. And as you accumulate properties, right, you might have a deal where you could make $40,000 today or keep $400 a month as a rental property. And a lot of people would go, well, if I have you know, cash is king or whatever. If I have 40,000 today, then what can I do with that 40 grand to make more money? Well, then you have to go chasing more deals. And in the real estate world, when you sell that property, you have to pay taxes. You don't have long-term wealth. You don't have the tax benefits. You don't have the uh, appreciating asset that you can mark as depreciating on paper. You aren't creating a passive income that will last many, many years. And uh, so he he's of the opinion that you should, when possible, buy and keep rental properties. However, he does encourage people to flip houses early on if they're, you know, if they, they're not uh, able to get loans from the bank or they don't have any money to work on or get, survive on, right? Flip a house or two and get yourself um, in a position where you could keep the next one. Uh, so Anyway, excellent little read. This is a short book. It reminds me a lot of the ABCs of Real Estate by Ken McElroy, but it had some uh, interesting, unique things in the finance section and how to use private money lenders and things like that. So Austin, great work here. Um, Get Free Houses by Austin Rutherford. I'll put the book in the show notes so you can purchase that from Amazon. And I hope you enjoy the read and enjoy your, your rental properties that you acquire. So anyway, thank you guys for listening. We'll catch you on the next one.